Hey everybody, we made it. All right, so we started at the most simple level of organization, which was the atomic level. We learned all about atoms. Then we learned how atoms combine to form molecules, the second level up the biological levels of organization. And once you have all the correct biomolecules together in the right order and in the right combinations, we can then reach the cellular level of organization. So the cellular level is ultimately the level in which all of those characteristics of life that we learned so far can take place. So let's go ahead and get started learning about cells. So let's start out with the idea that all organisms are made of cells. That's a big statement, okay? And here we could take two very different organisms. We have a plant. This might be like the leaf of a hydrangea plant. You might have one of these in your garden. Here we have little bunny rabbit. And if we take a look at what's inside of this leaf structure, you can see all these little tiny compartments, some of them elongated here, some more round. And these are all cells. If they have that little red dot in the middle, that makes them a cell. And if we look at the tissue of a rabbit and look on the inside, um, we're looking for little compartments that have a little purple dot on the inside. Now, all of those make up the cells of this organism, okay? The white blobs without the purple are a little something different, and we'll talk about them in a later lecture. But all organisms are made of cells as ultimately kind of like their building block. Cells are the simplest collection of matter that can perform all of the characteristics of life. So as we went around the wheel and we learned of what living things do, cells can do them all. And our third statement here is that they arise only by division of a previously existing cell. So all cells come from other cells. They go through a process called cell division. They don't just suddenly appear out of nothing, nor um, just go away into nothingness. So cells have to come from somewhere, right? Uh, that is until their lifespan ends. But the process of cell division allows us to make more cells. And these three ideas, these big, big ideas are part of something bigger called the cell theory. We talked about cell theory in our first chapter and now we're revisiting it again. These are three very big statements, so make sure you know them well. Next thing we're going to look at are the sizes of living things and their components. So if we take a look here, we're using the metric system, so that's why we have uh, everything based on a factor of 10 in this line here of sizes. And over here you can see we have three different colored arrows that cover different spans of sizes. And then we have examples going down here on the left, okay? So if we start real high at the big end, um, there are things that we can see with our unaided eye. We call these macroscopic forms of life here. For example, um, a little bit more than a meter, we have human height. Um, a little bit less than a meter, but still pretty darn long, are the lengths of some nerve and muscle cells. So what I want you to think about here is the tips of your fingers and the tips of your toes, okay? Those tips, as you know, can feel pain, pressure, cold, heat, they have little receptors in them. And the reason why you feel those way, uh, those different stimuli is because your brain is processing it. So how does it go from the tips of your fingers and the tips of your toes all the way to your brain to be processed? Well, you gotta have a really long, uh, essentially, connection to get there. So for example, if you have a tip of your toe, if she stubs her toe, that message has to go all the way up to her spinal cord in the back and then all the way up to the top of her brain. So those nerve and muscle cells can actually get pretty long, some just shy of three feet in length um, if it's going all the way up your back before um, essentially we call it synapsing with the spinal cord, making connection with the spinal cord. And by the way, this is what a nervous system cell looks like. Pretty weird, huh? We'll talk about those in future lectures too. Um, at the time, uh, if we go back in time a few hundred years, we find a man named Anton Van Leeuwenhoek. And this man was able to take a little handheld device, put a little tiny lens on it, and then put little tiny substances on the end of his little device and look at them and greatly enhance the magnification. So 
going from the unaided eye to using special tools brings us down in this range here okay so you can see a frog egg which is just a little bit more than a millimeter still visible with the unaided eye but if you have something else that aids it you're then going to kind of be in this territory here maybe not down all the way into this yellow territory but definitely at this end so you can see very very small things and it was like our first use of magnification at least noted use of magnification to give us uh uh, a more intense and, and, and invasive look at the microscopic world around us. So over the next couple of hundred years, um, many scientists are going to go to work on creating better light microscopes from that first initial lens that Van Leeuwenhoek used. Okay, Van Leeuwenhoek used things like pond water and tiny little organisms that he'd find in different substances to look at. But now with light microscopes essentially getting better decade after decade we're able to look further and further into small things that are on this range right here they eventually wound up adding a second lens to the first lens which allowed you to magnify the two of them together um, so for example if one of my lenses magnified 10 times and so did the other one and I put them together in the same apparatus I can uh, multiply those two 10 times 10 and get a hundred times magnification so I can start to see much much smaller things and as those light microscopes improved we are then able to see things like most plant and animal cells we could see the nucleus inside of a cell bacteria, and even in the really good ones, we can see mitochondria. So that's the range of the light microscope here. But that range had a bottom, and we had to go to some fancy new tools that employ the use of electrons to get us further. So um, what will happen is we're going to better the technology um, in, in order to see these really tiny things. But actually, before I get there, let me just go back to um, some of these notes on the side here. There was another person um, who is fondly remembered as making a contribution to the world of biology, and that's Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke is going to take the bark of a tree and take a look at it under one of these, we'll call it rudimentary microscopes. And what he notices is these tiny little hollows where cells may have once been. But he assumes that ultimately it's made of these things. And, you know, at that time, there's a lot of monasteries around and they all kind of look the same. Uh, you know, big empty room. Uh, maybe there's a cot in it, maybe some, some books and some light materials, but they're all side by side by side. So these empty little rooms, he thinks of them as cells within a monastery where, you know, the monks had to go in and sleep every night. So he goes ahead and uses the term cells after, you know, from his own experience, what he thinks about with them. But that sticks, that stays. So to this day, we're still calling these small units of life cells from its early uh, beginnings as just, uh, you know, some bark underneath a very rudimentary microscope. So that's pretty cool. All right, so progress continues, technology advances, and then we start using electrons to get us into the sub-microscopic world, we'll call it, where we can see the absolute smallest bacteria. We can even see viruses. We see something called ribosomes. We'll meet those in a little while. All those biomolecules we studied, like proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, we can look at those with electron microscopes. And we can even, we even have microscopes so powerful that we can see small molecules and even even atoms. So we now, in the past 15 years, have developed the technology to actually look at individual atoms underneath a microscope, and that's just awesome. Two of the types of electron microscopes we're going to talk about next are um, going to give us two different views of small biological matter, okay? The first one is what we call a SEM, a scanning uh, electron microscope. So the technique is scanning electron microscopy. And as you can see in the picture, we have these finger-like structures that are all seeming to be lined up. Some of them are bent, some of them are straight. The idea is behind a scanning electron microscope is that it scans the surface of very small structures. So we can see, for example, the outside 
of this cilia here. By the way, cilia are little hair-like projections that sit on the outside of cells, and they actually move. They can sweep uh, debris and matter from one area to another. So we actually have these lining our respiratory tract. So as we breathe in dust and debris from the air, they get caught in these cilia, and these move in a coordinated fashion to sweep it back up through your respiratory system up into your trachea, up into your throat, and we either swallow it or cough it out or exhale it at that point. So it serves a, us a purpose. It serves a purpose for defending us from things that shouldn't be in our body. But the key is that the SEM, the scanning electron microscope, scans the outside of structures. Now let's contrast that with transmission electron microscopy. Okay, still zeroes in on very small things, but now the electrons cut through the specimen and show us what's on the inside. So these cilia here, this is their interior here. So we're kind of looking at them from the side, from the side, and we can see there's these little long lines on the inside. So if we were studying them, we'd probably try to figure out what those are. Um, on the interior of the cilia. So definitely a different look, but they both ultimately magnify an incredible number of times to see what we see with them. There's two major types of cells that are out there in our biological world. Uh, one is called a prokaryote, and two is called a eukaryote. So we see they're prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. Now the prokaryotic cells are going to fit into the domains of bacteria and archaea. Now, this word domains, this may be new for some of you. So this is our new top of the pyramid in terms of biological um, organization. Perhaps you learned that there were five kingdoms. Well, recent research and work with DNA and RNA are showing us that the five kingdom way of dividing up all life was actually quite problematic. There were a lot of things that didn't make sense. So our new research has changed it where now we have domains at the top um, and they, we have three of them. And then underneath it, we have some kingdoms, not five anymore, but we have three kingdoms left. Okay. But let's just understand that all life is made up of these two different cells uh, two different kinds of cells split between three kingdoms, then we subdivide from there, okay? All right, so bacteria, we know what those are in a general sense. We're going to learn a lot more about them. And archaea, archaea is going to be new for a lot of you, so we'll talk about those in due time as well. But think of them as kind of a, a prehistoric type of bacteria that lives in some really funny places and still manages to survive, okay? Now, on the eukaryotic side, that's where we're going to have cells that fit into our protist groups called supergroups, and then our three kingdoms that are left. I'll put K's under them because they're, they're still kingdoms uh, fungi, animals, and plants. Okay, we have three kingdoms now. The protists, unfortunately, they lost their kingdomship. They were K's, but then newly discovered DNA and RNA technology showed us that they're actually more like the three other kingdoms than they are like one another. So we just split them up amongst the three kingdoms. And these all consist of eukaryotic cells. So the question comes up, which one is which? So is this the prokaryotic cell or is this one? Hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to come back to this and put a P and an E on them so you can differentiate between the two. Where we're going with this is we wanna know what char uh, characterizes a prokaryotic cell versus a eukaryotic cell. What are the traits? What are the structures that are gonna be different from one another? Are there other things that are different between the two? Let's go find out. Okay, so we're going to start here with bacteria. So this, again, is a prokaryotic kind of cell. It works great as a model organism. As you can see over here, we got a typical rod-shaped bacterium. Over here, we got a TEM view. All right, let's review what that was. Remember, there are two types of electron microscopes. This one I can see right into the inside. So this has to be a transmission electron microscope. And this bacterium has a name too. It's Bacillus coagulans, okay? A two-part name. We have a genus and species, kind of a cool name there. All right, let's do some filling in. Let's find out what parts these bacteria, these prokaryotic cells have, okay? First, we have a bacterial chromosome that you can see as a purple kind of loose arrangement. It almost looks like spaghetti, purple spaghetti, but that's its DNA. That's its chromosome, okay? And it's found in what we call the nucleoid region. It doesn't have an organized nucleus. It's just a nucleoid region in the 
interior of the cell itself. It just kind of floats around in there. Now, bacteria also can have um, ring DNA, okay? All this DNA right here is folded into a ring. Now, it's really hard um, to see how that's a ring, but remember, there's a lot of it here and it's all folded up on itself, but it doesn't have like a start end and a finish end. It is literally in a round ring, okay? And um, that's not all the DNA a bacteria has. It actually has a little bit extra that's found throughout here in little tiny rings and these are called plasmids, okay? It's extra DNA that it may have picked up from somewhere else, or it may be about to send it to another bacterium. And this is, um, this is a really interesting topic because bacteria actually have a way to communicate with each other. They have their own chemical language. And part of the words that they communicate with is when one bacterium sends one of these round rings of information to another bacterium. So there's actually a tube will come out of this cell into another and it will basically send that information over to another one. So perhaps a cell is, um, is one that is, we call pathogenic, that it could hurt you because it causes disease. Um, and we try to obviously neutralize bacteria through antibiotics. Well, what if the DNA that it sends over to another one was the code on how to survive through antibiotic treatment. And today, um, as you know, you've probably heard that some of our bacteria is very hard to fight. We call them multi-drug resistant bacterias. And that's because th these bacteria share those secrets with each other through DNA called plasmid. So a lot, lot to talk about with bacteria in a later chapter, but uh, just wanted to put that out to you because it is interesting. All right, what else do we have? We have ribosomes. Those are those little tiny brown specks that you see in so many places out here along the outside. Those are little protein factories. They make proteins. We have a plasma membrane. Plasma membrane is essentially going to be found in every type of cell, and it allows some things in and other things don't get in based on permission from that plasma membrane. We have a cell wall. We got a wall outside the membrane that makes it even tougher. Um, sometimes to uh, end a bacterium's life, you have to get through the wall. You gotta poke a hole in it so the stuff from the inside spills to the outside. Cell wall has a special chemical on the inside called peptidoglycan. When we talk about bacteria, we'll talk about the importance of that chemical too. Um, outside, uh, we also have what's known as a capsule. Capsules are typically outer layers of polysaccharides, um, which could function from cell to cell recognition, or perhaps uh, they're part of a toxin that could be released by a bacterium. There's a lot of different possibilities for the polysaccharide coat called a capsule on the outside. We have fimbriae. Fimbriae are these little hair-like structures here that allow them to attach to other cells or perhaps adhere to a surface, stick to a surface. Um, that's what those are gonna help with. And then we have flagella down here. Flagella are little whip-like tails that allow this bacterium to propel that way. So as these move around, the flagella will determine its directionality, okay? And perhaps if it had a strange other um, directional spin on it, maybe it could draw the bacteria move that way uh, towards a stimulus. So if we bottom line some major characteristics here uh, about bacteria and prokaryotic cells, they don't have true nuclei with membranes. So there's no true nucleus. There's only, if you remember, a nucleoid region, okay, a general area where it tends to congregate. DNA uh, in that unbound region, um, the region's called the nucleoid region. So um, Another thing we could say is that there's no mem membrane-bound organelles. There's not a lot going on inside of a bacterium. There's cytoplasm in here, which I should probably point out as well. So that's right here. We can go ahead and just write that in, cytoplasm. And that's kind of like your gelatinous fluid that holds in everything inside this cell, cytoplasm. And it's this peach-colored stuff in there, the um, transparent fluid. And uh, to be a... Um, a membrane bound organelle means you got to have a little bit more structure than what we find in here and you got to be made of a membrane we don't see that it's just cytoplasm ribosomes and the dna really in the plasmids so no membrane bound organelles in there and your cytoplasm's held in by that plasma membrane the uh layer on the most inner surface here of the outside itself so that's your cell membrane
Now, if we switch over to eukaryotic cells, um, let's talk about their major characteristics, being that we just answered those for the prokaryotes. They do have a true nucleus. A true nucleus is right here, and a true nucleus has a membrane. We also have cytoplasm in this type of cell. And we also have a cell membrane in this type of cell too. So those three big things, um, aside from being a true nucleus versus a nucleoid region, having cytoplasm and having a cell membrane, those are shared amongst all cells, right? But some of the additional stuff that makes a eukaryote a eukaryote is, for example, that detail about the nucleus, that it does have a membrane around the outside and the bacterium it didn't. It has membrane-bound organelles. And you can see this, these arrows here, this thing, this thing, and that. Those are organelles, and they're made by membrane. They're bound by membranes. Eukaryotic cells are generally much larger than prokaryotic cells, okay? Let's look up a, a little comparison here, okay? Here's your eukaryotic cell in size, and look at this little tiny prokaryote, right? So if you brought it down to scale, you're on the range of maybe two or three micrometers for the prokaryote and maybe anywhere from you know 10 to to 30 micrometers for the eukaryotic cell you see there's a lot more volume involved here than in this one here okay so again think back to the which one is which question i think this is going to help you figure them out as well all right so here is a big picture, very pretty picture, lots of colors, of all the things that are going on inside of every cell in your body. You got a hundred trillion of these, maybe more, that make up your human body, okay? Look at some of the words that we come across and get familiar with them. Say them out loud, read them, write them. Endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, microvilli, vesicle, lysosome, peroxisome. Well, why I'm saying these is because you got to get used to hearing the language of biology. There are complicated words, but the more you say them, the more you hear them, the more you write them, you're going to get better with them as well. Okay. So start saying them as you write them. Endoplasmic reticulum, lysosome, peroxisome, vesicle hearing them and saying them is some of the best practice you can do. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to be learning about all these. So um, you got to learn the lingo and it's going to make you more effective when you're studying each one. So we're going to take a little outside and inside look at cells uh, before we get to all the organelles. And uh, let's hit the outside first. As we talked about in both cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, they shared a common feature, which was the cell membrane. It is a selective barrier. So what that means is some things are allowed to go in and other things are not. So it must, every cell must have sufficient passage of oxygen, nutrients, and waste to service the volume of each cell. And this little cutout here, just a a small fragment of a cell membrane is how it's done, okay? So let's let's go back in time a little bit and talk about biomolecules so we can kind of uncode what we're looking at. Here I see a little tiny head and I see two legs coming off of it. Well, we studied that when we studied lipids, right? That was what we called a phospholipid and look how many there are, a whole sea of them, okay? And interspersed in that lipid C, we have proteins. And some of them go all the way through, some of them are really funky shaped, and then some of them only go halfway through, okay? There's a variety of different type of proteins on the inside, outside, and right through the whole membrane. And these are ultimately the gatekeepers for the nutrients that gotta get through, okay? It's either gonna help them through, prevent them from coming through, or perhaps pump them against a normal gradient, okay? Now, oxygen, um, carbon dioxide, that's gonna have more of a freedom to go right through in and out uh, because they are so small. And uh, some of the waste, like big particles, you actually need to blob them out from the membrane itself and they'll actually form what's called a vesicle. So this is really, really a busy place, a bu busy interface of the cell. Now, the general structure of biological membranes are double layers of phospholipids with proteins interspersed. So remember, 
you got one layer on top, you got one layer here. Okay, someone gave you, you know, the uh, imagine if you could peel the two layers apart here. This is the part here that stays away from water, hates water, right? But this is a watery exterior environment, and this is a watery interior environment. And you notice that the blue circles here have no problem being right next to the water. They are what we call hydrophilic. They love water. Meanwhile, the nonpolar fatty acid tails of the phospholipids, they hate water. So we say they're hydrophobic. They have a phobia of water. That's why they're on the inside, protected from the water on the outside, okay? All right, so one membrane is made of two layers, a top and a bottom, whoops. And we again, we said they are made. those are made of phospholipids, phospholipid bilayer, we call it, and proteins are sticking out all over the place. If you were wondering what these things are, these are actually carbohydrate chains, and we'll get to their um, function in our membrane chapter coming up. Okay, let's talk about sizes of cells, okay? Now, we covered metabolism. We said it was basically the collection of all the chemical reactions that take place within a cell or an organism, um, and that they keep that organism in a narrow range of values, okay? But what they need and need to get rid of is actually going to limit the size they can be, okay? Now, we have this idea, if we look down at these cells right here, that the surface area of, let's say a cell was more cubic than it was round. Um, and in this case here, a cube would have six faces. Here's one, here's one, here's another one, another one on the left, on the top, and in the back. Okay, so in this big cube of 30 micrometers right here in size, you can see the surface area, if you added up all those sides together, about 5,400 micrometers cubed. Okay, seems like a lot of micrometers. But then imagine if we took a knife, a tiny little submicroscopic knife, and we cut this into slices. Two down the front, two across, two down lengthwise, and we were able to split that big cell into essentially 27 small cubes by making a number of cuts. Now the volume is still the same. I haven't done anything. I just passed a knife through it. So it still has the same volume, but look how the surface area has changed. 16,200 micrometers in comparison to the 5,400. Where did they all come from? Well, remember, this is a solid cube that only had six surfaces a minute ago. Now I got 27 small cubes, each with its own surface, some of them buried on the inside, but those are still surfaces now. So we've greatly increased the, what we call the surface area to volume ratio, okay? We have the same volume, we just have a huge amount more surface area than we did before by making these cells small. As surface area increases in cells by a factor of n squared, the volume will increase by n cubed, okay? Small cells have a larger surface area relative to the volume, okay? Look at how small these are. Same volume, just a whole bunch of additional cells that weren't there before for a three, three time increase in surface area. So I think we've answered the question, which has more surface area, the big cell or the cell that's broken up. So you can go ahead and uh, circle that in your notes. And the other thing I wanted to mention is which scenario allows for faster inputs and outputs. So I want you to think of this. Think of this. Think about this. This nucleus inside here needs stuff. It needs stuff in and it needs to get stuff out. And the way that typically happens is through diffusion. So if something was to diffuse in, it's going to obviously take a little while to get to that nucleus, right? And then for stuff to get out of the middle of the cell, same thing, it's gotta diffuse and that takes time through a liquid. But then if you look at these cells over here, imagine you had to get something in and out. Not nearly as many arrows required to reach that nucleus and get it to the cell membrane, okay? So here, you're definitely not waiting around for food to get there or for waste to get out. So big cells like this, would either starve to death or they would poison themselves to death with a little waste they can't get out fast enough. Where if you're small, it's in and out real quick and it keeps you healthy. So faster inputs and outputs, small cells, slower, big cells. 
one last look. Here we have um, a little tiny box that has, again, six sides. So it is total surface area six. Here we have a much bigger box that has six sides and it has a surface area of 150. If I cut this big box into even more pieces, uh, I could get 750 surfaces amongst the same size volume, which is 125 for each one. So the surface area to volume ratio is how ultimately we would divide the surface area by the volume. In the case of the big cell here, it'd be 1.2. And then in the case of this one here, 750 divided by 125 is six. So the surface area to volume ratio for each one of these is at a six. And that's ultimately what is gonna keep cells small because inputs and outputs are faster and these are healthier cells than those that are very large. Again, another look at uh, our cell and all the things inside of it. Very pretty picture here. A lot of those terms being repeated. And it's at this point here, we're going to start diving in. We're going to finish out with talking about the nucleus. And then in the next lecture, we'll talk about the organelles that are inside of a cell. Okay, so let's go ahead to the nucleus. All right, so all of your eukaryotic cells genetic instructions are going to be housed in the nucleus okay this idea uh, of the nucleus and the discovery of it was made by a couple of scientists named brown and virkow the nucleus contains most of the dna in a eukaryotic cell there's a little bit extra in some organelles and we'll talk at a later time about but let's just imagine that most of this organism's dna is encoded in its own center of the cell called the nucleus it contains most of the cell's genes and is usually the most conspicuous organelle. So if I look at it underneath a microscope, I see a dark spot inside of a cell, I'm most likely looking at the nucleus. It does have a membrane, as we mentioned earlier, which encloses the nucleus and it will separate it from the cytoplasm here, which is on the outside. The nuclear membrane is also a bilayer, like we just saw, and um, it's made of the same things that we saw in the biomolecule lecture. Of course, it comes from the world of lipids. It's our double layer of phospholipids. And here you can see um, INM, INM and ONM. That's an inner nuclear membrane and outer nuclear membranes. And the inside is the INM, outside ONM. And again, we've just answered that question, what small structure is the bilayer made from? So make sure you answer that in your lecture notes. And let's do some fill-ins while we're here. Um, very pretty picture of the nucleus itself and a little bit of membrane on the outside. So our big purple sphere with the cutout, that's the nucleus. We have on the outside this blue stuff here called rough ER. It's also made of membrane and we'll talk about it when we get into the organelles but um, it does sit on the outside of the nucleus um, there is usually a connection point i'll show you where that is right here where the two connect your nucleus also has a what what is that nucleolus it's not a typo nope it's not so your nucleus has what's called a nucleolus a dark spot in the center of itself as well and there's a variety of things that go on in the nucleolus um, as well as deal with ribosomal RNA, and um, we'll talk about that in the future too. We also have chromatin. So all this stuff here, this unwound spaghetti looking stuff, this is the DNA, okay? Right now it's unwound, it's not in chromosomes, and you can see it's filling up the majority of the nucleus. We have the nuclear envelope on the outside. We talked about an inner membrane and outer membrane. Uh, we also have holes called nuclear pores. That's what this one, this one got cut off in half. But here's another one. You can see um, it's made of purple. So we said our, you know, our real basic um, um, diagram key is if it's a big purple blob, usually it has protein, it has something to do with protein, right? So we got purple blobs on our purple nucleus here. And uh, they're kind of in the shape of a donut. They let things in and out. So they're, they have a function there and the pore complex is all of those proteins in the ring together. 
the brown spots are still the ribosomes. They're really tiny. You see them all over the surface of the outer nuclear membrane. You see them on the rough ER as well. And again, they're protein making factories, okay? Um, last thing before we switch over, on the inside, there is something called the lamina. So this is a bunch of crisscrossing protein that give a little structural integrity to the nucleus so it doesn't fall apart on you. Uh, this picture here, try to guess as to what type of uh, electron microscope would take this picture. To you, would it be a SEM or a TEM? What do you think? Go ahead and put it in on your notes based on what we talked about. All right, uh, those pores are gonna regulate the entry and exit of molecules. So on the inside, you'll have things leaving. Sometimes we'll have things coming in from the outside as well. Um, here's another bit about that nuclear lamina that kind of holds our nucleus together. It's made of protein. And in the nucleus, DNA and proteins form genetic material called chromatin, okay? So that was that uh, loose assortment of almost look like purple spaghetti in the nucleus. It condenses at some point in the, what we call the cell cycle in a cell's life to form discrete chromosomes. So you are probably more familiar with chromosomes than you are with loose chromatin at this point, and that's okay, all right? We even have a um, couple of chromosomes called the sex chromosomes where you have an X chromosome and you have a Y chromosome, okay? Now I'm not doing the Y chromosome any justice, kind of this little tiny little bit of chromosomal material. It's not actually like in the big form of a Y like you'd expect, but um, they are part of your chromosomal set and chromosome is nothing but wound up DNA. It's there when your cell's ready to divide. So here's what it looks like when you have loose chromatin winding up. You got these little pink balls here, they're called histones, that uh, the DNA winds around and this superstructure right here will eventually happen as it gets all wound up. The nucleolus was the dark spot within the nucleus itself and it's the site of what we call ribosomal RNA synthesis. So your ribosomes have a component of RNA um, as part of them and we talked about RNA as kind of like the uh, close relative to DNA, except it was single stranded and it carried messages most of the time. Okay, there's a couple other types of RNA out there, and that's for another lecture. But think of copying, you know, a page from a book a number of times and then, you know, giving it out to people that need them. And that's kind of what a nucleus will do when it copies the DNA and sends out a copy to the ribosomes to be printed to, to turn into workable proteins. Okay, so here's your nucleolus, your dark spot inside of the nucleus, the loose chromosomes around it. And um, I think we'll do um, ribosomes and then we'll, uh, we'll end the lecture. So ribosomes, these are your protein factories. They're made of protein and ribosomal RNA. They kind of look like two halves of a hamburger bun. You know, got the bottom half that's a little bit smaller and you got the puffy top half that's the large unit and the su uh, large subunit and the small subunit. Their job, carry out protein synthesis in two locations. Um, in the cytosol, which is like the cytoplasm, which has free ribosomes floating around. And on the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum, that was that uh, structure you saw connected to the nuclear membrane, which we call bound ribosomes. So you have free ones that just float around and you got bound ones. And the key is that these two units are together and information will be threaded through the middle of them. Here's a look at them. Here's your large and small subunits. And if you look at our little TEM here, you can see there's a lot of free floating ones here. But if you look at these sets of lines, these are membrane lines for your endoplasmic reticulum. And if you look real close, you can start to see them lining up attached to that surface. And that's what we call a bound ribosome. So you got free ones that are floating in here and then you got bound ones to the actual membrane themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop this lecture here, um, give you some breathing room before we get into the endomembrane system and the uh, specific organelles, but we've seen a lot. We've seen um, general information about cells, the types of cells, uh, why they're small and not big. We covered what the nucleus, uh, what its structure is, what its function is, which is housing the DNA, the genetic instructions. Some people call it the control center of the cell, which is, is very apt. Um, we talked about ribosomes 
as well. So we've covered a, a bit of distance here. We got a lot more to go, but um, uh, we'll look for that at the next lecture. So I hope you learned a lot and uh, make sure you take your time with, with all your lectures and you get down as much as you can. I'll catch you at the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you.